everybody, welcome to Amateur Cast, the show where we pretend to know what we're talking about. My name is Sebastian Limon, and I am joined with Colby Leapies. The Jared Leto train ends here. Thank Correct. God. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Speaking of Jared Leto, there are m- movies. Jared Leto is in movies, and there's movie nominations. Oh, God. What a way to start. You want to try that one again? No, I, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Good, hello, everybody. Well, fine. Uh, yes, as of the day we're recording this, Monday, uh, March 15th, the Oscar nominations have just come out this morning. A lot of good surprises, a lot of good stuff. Uh, a couple of snubs, but the, the snub that I am very happy about is that Jared Leto did not get nominated as a supporting actor. I haven't even seen the little things. I, I don't know if he's, maybe he's good in it, but I don't like him, and I don't care to find out. Heck yeah. I, I agree. <laughs> I I have nothing to say. <laughs> Other than the reason we bring this up is, well, we're not going to talk about the whole nominations this week. But we are going to bring up a fact that surprised us. Is the director we're speaking of today, Thomas Vinterberg, is nominated for Best Director at the Academy Awards. Which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, that was such a... Fa- like a perfectly timed surprise that was so awesome i know uh, that we were going to record this episode today and then i woke up this morning and i was watching the video and pretty much everything was going as i expected it i, I had most i predicted very well actually i counted like mm-hmm. i got 76 spots out of the 100 that i predicted right nice. um but uh yeah when his name popped up i was like blo- i couldn't believe it i was i was happy i, I think he really deserves it oh um, yeah which is why we're dedicating an episode to him He's, a, he's good at what he does, believe it or not. <laughs> the reason he's nominated. Yes, very much. But yeah, we're not going to be talking about the Oscar nominees in detail today because we're saving that for a future episode. Uh, foreshadow, foreshadow. Uh, more information on that to come next week. But we are going to be talking about um, Another Round, the Thomas Vinterberg film for which he is nominated this year, which is also nominated in foreign film. And I think we all know it's going to win. Uh, we're also yeah. going to be talking about Thomas Vinterberg's, um, a different Thomas Vinterberg film, uh, which is really a companion piece to another round. It has a lot of the same cast, uh, same co-writer, uh, and that is The Hunt from 2012. Both Danish films, both starring Mads Mikkelsen as a teacher that gets himself into some trouble. <laughs> <laughs> he goes through something. He goes through a journey. <laughs> Like like in many movies that you may have heard of, the character does indeed go through a journey. <laughs> Correct. Or else it'd just be boring. Ah, <laughs> oh, the Danish. Why didn't we think of that? I don't know. How did know. they beat us to that? <laughs> I know. Um, so today, we're going to first talk about The Hunt from 2012, directed by Thomas Vinterberg, starring Mads Mikkelsen, and other Danish actors that I can't name from the top of my head. Uh, Thomas Bo Larsen and Lars Ranth and uh, Suse Wold. I don't know. I, I'm probably butchering their names. I, I don't speak Danish, believe it or not. But, I'm so uh, sorry yeah. if you're listening. <laughs> we and respect also you. they're both uh, co-written by Tobias Lindholm. All right. Um, Colby, what is The Hunt about? Tell us. So The Hunt to put it simply, is about a kindergarten teacher played by Mads Mikkelsen who is essentially falsely accused of abusing some students. Mm -hmm. Uh, And his whole world, his whole life, his whole family falls apart from this one small lie. Uh, It is sort of a... It's, it's a pretty straightforward drama, but I feel like it has some small thriller elements in it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I hadn't seen this before until last week watching it for this podcast, but I've been hearing about it for years, having absolutely no idea what it was about. I was actually very, like, like taken aback when I realized what the premise was, because that's not what I was expecting, but... Um, oh, wow. It's definitely been hyped up as, like, one of the best foreign films for me. And mm-hmm. uh, I got to say, it's it's pretty dang good. Pretty dang good. What did you think, Sebastian? Yeah, uh, I knew about this movie 
back in 2012, like back in the day, um, the way that I would discover movies, I'd go on Fandango <laughs> and just scroll or like uh, Rotten Tomatoes back mm-hmm. in the day when I thought Rotten Tomatoes was a uh, vi- viable source or a good source <laughs> for reviews. What do you mean? Um, it's not? No. Oh, God. It's not. <laughs> you hear that today, folks? Ron, t- Suck. Ron Tomatoes Ron said Tomatoes. that Amazing Spider-Man was certified fresh. Am I not supposed to like that movie? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> just how Under the Silver Lake has negative reviews, yet it's an amazing film. No, uh, I uh, I saw the high rating on it, and it was like, I watched the trailer as a kid. Um, that's basically kind of how I discovered the movies that everybody was talking about or the movies that were getting nominations, the movies that needed to be seen, right? And um, I had never gotten around to actually watching the movie until I finally got an excuse to buy it for the podcast. And um, yeah, it was great. I um, You had mentioned that it has like thriller elements, Mm-hmm. Um, it this even has to relate to like another round, but I think from the films that we've seen of Thomas Vinterberg so far, he basically takes premises that Hollywood could totally make into stupid, glorified, non subtle movies, mm-hmm. but Vinterberg approaches them in a very realistic way. Another round could totally be a Jason Bateman, Ed Ed Helms comedy about <laughs> guys that constantly get drunk at a certain level and and comedy ensues. Or even The Hunt could totally be like a Liam Neeson <laughs> thriller thing that's <laughs> yeah. like really it. lame and really yeah. on the nose and shaky cam all over the place. And Vinterberg does use a lot of shaky that. cam, but it's kind of a different kind. It's 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 a more intimate. Uh, kind yeah, of shaky cam it's as different. opposed to the. It's not. It's not even shaky. It's just handheld. As opposed it's to handheld, the action yeah. shaky hand shaky cam of the two thousands. Yeah, no, it, it's it's there's more of a purpose for sure in the way that the cinematography is handled in both of the movies. But um, uh, I just love how real both movies feel. They like the way that especially this one i keep relating to both movies we're just we're talking about the hunt the hunt mainly just it, it really feels super real and how it it, it um it uh, it shows mass hysteria it's a small town a small town hearing about this news you know there's not like these huge riots that happen um there's there aren't these big explosive scenes that are you know, shoving it in your face uh, mm-hmm. um, of what the theme is and the message is and what the whole thing is about. It's very subtle. It's very, it's a slow burn for sure, but it's, I think the second things begin to pick up, like when the actual inciting incident happens, I I kind of just lean forward in my, in my couch and just <laughs> was uh, with it the entire movie. Great movie. I can see myself watching this again for sure. Yeah, um, I also definitely like, we'll probably talk about both movies at the same time. And the reason we're putting them together is because they are such great companion pieces. They definitely feel like um, two pieces of the same whole as far as Mm -hmm. just their kind of parallel stories and uh, similar people behind the camera and in front of it. But the thing about them that they they both fall under this this, um, movement from danish filmmaking called dogma 95 are you aware of this sebastian it sounds very familiar so i did some research on this after watching both movies and listening to some interviews with uh with thomas vinterberg where he where he brought this up and i I wasn't familiar with the term so dogma 95 is basically this this philosophy that thomas vinterberg and lars von trier came up with in the late 90s and they they wrote something called the the Mm -hmm. dogma manifesto um i in i was about to say what was your with it again then it's literally called dogma 95 (laughs) because it was written in 1995 anyways um the idea is that they wanted to purify filmmaking quote unquote by 
um, refusing to make anything with like expensive budgets or like mm-hmm. major special effects. They they didn't want anything to be um, you know artificial. They wanted to concentrate only on like the story and the performances uh, in their most pure, like mm-hmm. broken down, bare bones form. Um, which is why you have both of these movies have such a similar style where everything is shot on location. Um, the camera is always handheld. Naturalistic lighting. Um, na- very naturalistic lighting. They, they don't use yeah. any sort of like filters uh, for their camera lens. They don't, um, I believe they don't use color grading. It's super, it's not flashy in any way. Yeah, I believe they're both shot on mm-hmm. 35 millimeter. Um, and they don't contain any sort of like kind of contrived or superficial action um in in the manifesto they both wrote that they did not want to include like any murders or like crime plots or stuff that like normal people don't experience throughout Mm -hmm. their normal life yeah uh, day to day right um so both of these movies have this really incredible like authentic feel and i feel like american movies do that a lot but for some reason i feel like in american movies what directors think will feel real actually feels more contrived Mm. sometimes like i always hear people talk about movies that are in black and white and say that makes it feel more real and i'm like but you know that Uh, real life is in color right like that is not more real that is that is (laughs) actively less realistic if it's in black and white (laughs) right and in the manifesto, I, they did write that uh, all their movies need to be in color because uh, mm-hmm. real life is in color. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it. We. I feel like in American movies, there's a lot of talk about what's authentic and what's gritty and what's real, and this doesn't really fall into that. This is real in a more mundane oh, way yeah, and sure. in a more intimate way. It's. It doesn't feel like it's being real. American movies almost feel like they are sometimes real in a showy way, which is like an oxymoron. But no, I, I get you. I don't know. This this feels almost like a documentary. Yeah, it feels like a very lived-in town, real people. And you're just kind of yeah. experiencing an event that happened. Just, just just like one event that happened with these people. And you, can, you feel like there's a history between everybody. Um, there's just a, a foundation of where we're at and... This just happens to be one of the stories that's that we're witnessing, and the the hunt is based on real stories that, um, that the two writers had read about of teachers of kindergarten or elementary school being falsely accused of pedophilia or uh, mm-hmm. other kinds of child abuse, and so they they just thought that was an interesting enough subject to write a film on, and they said that basically they uh, want to not they don't want to shine a, a a light away from the real abuse that happens, but rather to shine a light on um, how love can make people kind of go crazy yeah. and become paranoid and how a, such a, fos- a positive force as love can result in such negative violence and aggression as it does in The Hunt. Because when when uh, Lucas, the main character played by Mads Mikkelsen, when his friends and family find out what he's supposedly done. Oh, I just said supposedly. That's so annoying. What that he's supposedly <laughs> done. Um <laughs> a lot of violence and aggression. They didn't even question out. Um I made a joke right before we started recording that both of these movies have a super similar uh scene that ends with Mads Mikkelsen having a bloody forehead. Like <laughs> Yeah. And they honestly look the same, like those two shots with that bloody makeup looks. It's like the same yeah, spot, pretty, pretty much. much. <laughs> no, yeah. um, you. I, I want to kind of um, elaborate on what you were saying, and that it's kind of a different side of this this uh, the story, because you would think if it's a story about a person who or like a um. Uh, an event of, of 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 these kids being molested or like of of this man being accused you would think that the story would be about it actually happening like uh, like a spotlight scenario yeah like a spotlight type of thing but this shows the side of someone who's actually innocent 
And same thing with another round. You would think a movie about alcoholism or drinking would be negative. And it kind of shows the positive aspects of drinking and what it can do. And it's almost very light. Uh, I, I love that he, the Vinterberg takes these concepts and not only doesn't make them stupid and glorifies them and makes them unsubtle, but he, he, we're able to witness or at least see a different aspect uh, than what we 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 normally expect of that, especially today with the whole Me Too movement and. I mean, I know this was before that, but mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are advocating against, you know, assault and and um, molestation and all that. And to have a story where it's about someone who's actually innocent from that, I think is pretty, um, it, 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 it's not something that you would expect with what right. has been going on today. Yeah, it's an interesting, different perspective than what we're used to. And you can definitely tell that it's made in 2012. Um, I feel like it, it would have to be made a little bit differently today. Not that it uh, is insensitive or doesn't age well in any way. I just feel like no, it might be more... Um, I don't know. Because, yeah, like you're saying, it is absolutely about a man who is innocent. And that's a really strong choice that Vinterberg makes from the very beginning of the film is to show us that he's innocent. And I feel like yeah. there were points that I expected it to be a mystery. Oh, and yeah. Maybe just because of what I'm used to in American films, I kept thinking, I don't know, maybe there should be some mystery here. Like maybe it'd be more entertaining mm -hmm. if I didn't know exactly what happened or if he did it or why he's being accused. But I feel like that would kind of, even though there were, there were parts of me that wanted that throughout the film, I feel like that would kind of go against what Vinterberg is doing here. Yeah. Which again is not trying to take like take away any sort of spotlight from actual abuse but simply to uh show that the the sort of passion and the protectiveness that we that we have for those we love can um can result in pretty nasty stuff and mm -hmm. it, it's it's just it's very interesting and it's a very nuanced uh theme i feel like it isn't like it, <sighs> Because every every character in it does some bad things, but every character in it is so human and understandable. Yeah. Um, you you really like get and sympathize it's frustrating with all of them, and even if. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's the best way to say it is mm -hmm. that like he wants to replicate real life, and real life is not simple and clean cut. It is frustrating. It is complicated. There are mistakes. People who are innocent get mm -hmm. accused, um, of things they didn't do. And yeah, like you said, that, that would be the American way of having a mystery element yeah. to it. And not that that's bad, but that's not what Vinterberg was going for. It was just more of mm -hmm. the just kind of viewing what hysteria does to people. Oh, my God. I yeah. Just voice crack. Horrifying. <laughs> Ignore that. Do you, want, that wasn't me. do you want me to cut that out? No, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> I think we were saying how it's not dated. The reason it's not dated is because yeah, it's no. not like they question the girl or they say, like, they don't believe her. They, I mean, you you don't even question that. When the little kid says that, mm -hmm. you want to believe them. And you want nothing but the worst for the person who did what they did. And Right. As Which is why you can sympathize so much with the people who are yeah. so angry at your protagonist which is such a hard thing to pull off as a writer it's really impressive oh yeah and uh, that's just what made it extra frustrating because you can't be mad at them for reacting the way that they're reacting because i think that's the way we would naturally react i mean mm -hmm. i hope any decent human being would but uh yeah. it, it and you can't be mad at the girl because she's a child and she like she doesn't know what she's doing totally understand she yeah she doesn't understand the impacts of what she's saying she does not understand what she's done in the done, film yeah. where she says like i'm i'm sorry what i said something stupid i didn't know this would spiral so much out of proportion mm -hmm. yeah and even when it i think they even mentioned that at some point when she said she even tells the parents i didn't even say anything no no mm -hmm. that um nothing happened i just said something stupid and then the parent 
her mom, I think, tells her, no, it happened. You know, you're just trying to say, <laughs> you're just, you know, you're just trying to, what's, what's the term? Just, uh, she says that like, you're trying to, uh, forget it. Yeah. Like, you're just, your you're, you're trying to forget it. it. Yeah. It's too hard. It's too to, hard for yeah, you to it's process. Too hard to it's, you're it's just too trying to uncomfortable. Like, push it down. It's too uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad they brought that up because it's like, uh, it, it gives it an extra frustrating level to the whole experience because yeah. you know he's innocent, yet the way these people react is is just. And mm-hmm. I even mentioned to my mom, like, shouldn't they do, like, I don't know, like a lie detector on the guy? And I didn't even think of that. You know what I mean? Like, shouldn't they do that? But then you kind of think, yeah. like, but then you're not validating the victim's Right. The, the victim at all. It's just kind of questioning. And if I was in that situation, done. I don't think that I would even consider that. I would just be upset. I would just. Exactly. Be, I would. I, yeah. You I wouldn't would want to question it. You wouldn't want to put the person down. You want to believe them and bring death to whoever did what they did. So, yeah, it's it's very it's very well done and it's very tense in the best way possible. Where there are moments here and there where he's kind of under attack there's not like a stupid chase scenes where people are um chasing yeah. him in the car there's no gun gun and uh, people aren't shooting at him there's just people throwing I, I will say i did kind of go into it expecting it to be an action movie uh-huh. to some extent not necessarily an action movie but a movie with a bit more you know contrived superficial like um conflict because yeah. for, i mean First of all, that's just my American expectation from this kind of plot. But also, it, when I was looking up, like, images of the movie, like, stills, there's, like, pictures of him with a gun. And now I know it's because he hunts deer as a hobby. That's, like, the subplot. Yeah. Um, and it is called The Hunt Yeah. for that. But it sounds kind of like, like you said earlier, like a Liam Neeson, like, The Hunt, like, The Hunt is on. Yeah, it's, it's something dumb him. like that, yeah. And also, this is just a funny thing. When I looked up the film on IMDb right before I watched it, I was reading through that, like, you know, the parents guide where it says, like, like if there's, like, a lot of blood oh, or yeah, a lot yeah. of profanity or whatever, uh, just out of curiosity. Uh-huh. And I I read the wrong The Hunt. I, we should have clarified this earlier. There's another movie called The Hunt. It came out last oh, year. Oh, crap. It's an American movie. I forgot about Universal. that. It, was, it had some controversy. It was in the news. It got banned. This is not that movie. If, the, if you're thinking that we're talking about the movie that was in the news last year, totally different movie. No, that movie but sucks. But I read the IMDb page for that movie, and it said, like, oh, yeah, there's a scene where um, a grenade gets shoved down a man's pants, and his legs explode, and it's very bloody. And I was like, why? <laughs> like, Thomas what? Winterberg did that? Why? <laughs> <laughs> why is that in this movie? <laughs> Imagine. So this is what you get for touching my girl. And that. just put it. <laughs> uh, take away what, what you gave my daughter. Your, oh, my God. Take away your penis or something. And then boom, explosion. Oh, my God. Yes. That's probably what would happen in the stupid in, in Liam, Liam Neeson, Neeson movie. Version, yeah. <laughs> I like Liam Neeson. I don't want to bash that. I dude, know. But the, recently, he's becoming the, the next Bruce tankish. Willis. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Make something good, please. <laughs> but yeah, overall, um, I definitely appreciated the hunt's nuance and its very unique perspectives. I really feel like uh, the dog, the the Dogma ninety five mm-hmm. influence on it allowed it to have such a unique perspective that is so much more sympathetic and understandable yeah um for everybody in the movie yeah when you Um, when you mentioned the the dog what is it dogma yeah it's called dogma 95 dogma 95 i i can i can definitely see the influence in that for sure and everything there's yeah so many great scenes in this and that church scene probably my favorite scene of the movie oh my god Oh my god! Incredible. Po- if you if you've seen posters for this movie, it's the poster scene. Yeah, it's, it's that poster that that, that, that image. That great of... shot of Mads Mikkelsen looking over his shoulder with like the little bit of blood on his nose, and you're like, it's like chilling. It's super corny, but it's I mean, and, and what I'm about to say, not the scene. The scene's amazing. I'm oh, saying. I was gonna say it's not corny. At no, all. the the scene's not corny at all. I'm saying like what I'm about to say is super corny, but it's you you see it in his eyes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's really one of those 
his pain. You can really definitely see yeah. the pain in his eyes in that scene and just feel everything. It's such a great Mads moment. Mads Mikkelsen, as an actor, is so good at, at, I was going to say at emoting, and that sounds like like basic acting, one, like every actor <laughs> should be good at emoting. Emote. But I feel like him especially, like, it's hard to say this without it sounding like, yeah, duh, every actor does that. But he's so especially good at, like, I agree. just with very subtle facial expressions, you know exactly what he's feeling. If oh, right. yeah, for sure. Um, his, his, his face expressions aren't that big. If you look at, like, stills of his face in every shot of the movie, they're not often that that different physically, but mm -hmm. he's really good at just with his whole attitude, all his mannerisms, just really um, bringing what's very subtle uh, to the surface. And we, I think a lot of people can associate Mads Mikkelsen by being a villain. He's a villain in Marvel. He's a right. James Bond villain. He's Hannibal Lecter. And yeah, Americans, this... Uh, uh, only we can only have American heroes. He's Danish. He's got to be yeah. that guy. I mean, he's a hero in in what Rogue One, I guess. But um, is he? I feel like he's like a weird kind of anti. He, no, I guess he's a good guy. He's a good guy. It's but just, he like, he, but he, he like was... works for the Empire. Yeah, but it was it was against his will. Right. He wanted a different I life. I don't remember that movie very well. It wasn't. <laughs> it was fine, <laughs> but um. I don't know, this one definitely made him feel not like a character, but like a person that you would meet yeah. on the street and sympathize with. He really disappears into his, into his roles. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, both of them, both of these movies made me um, appreciate Mads much more. Before I really liked him a lot, I thought I associated him as like a great villain to play in a movie. Now I just see him as a great actor to be in a movie. Yeah. So, yeah, great, great stuff. Um, real quick, um, without, I mean, do you want to spoil the ending or no? Um, we can, and I'll put like a thing in the description, like skip to here. Yeah, it's been out for a while. So, okay, so I'll put a little link in the description if you want to hear, if you don't want to hear the spoiler, but you still want to hear our ratings for the film? Um, just go ahead and 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 check the description and yeah. press that press that button. Okay, three, two, one. Spoilers go now. Bruce Willis is a ghost. Oh my god. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> what uh, if somebody hasn't seen Sixth Sense? Imagine. But they but they have seen The Hunt and then <laughs> they're like, Bro. oh, I'm I'm all set. And you say that and they're like, damn it. <laughs> you lied to me. <laughs> Um, no, at the end of the movie, essentially, the f the the father of the daughter, who is, is lifelong friends with Matt Mickelson, Lucas, kind of gives him a peace offering after, which is after the great scene in the church when he kind of mm -hmm. confronts him with his amazing, like, performance and just the pain in his eyes and that he's, like, losing everything, self-respect, uh, respect from others um any sense of dignity everything and he just kind of confronts him and from there the friend kind of feels some sort of conviction and, and almost rethinks everything and i want to say it's either it, it goes out in two ways either he still is convinced his friend did it but forgives him or he believes that he's innocent. It's either or. It's not really made clear. I took it as the second one because I feel like you couldn't forgive somebody for that. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, it's not said explicitly. Um, that's just it could be. Yeah, it. the second one. And I want to know who do you think tried to shoot him at the end? It's weird. It's so the end. The, again, spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. Yeah. The, the very last shot of the movie is that when. Um, Lucas is taking his son hunting, which is sort of a flash forward that shows us that he's been like re-entered back into society and into his friend group. Yeah, because that that's all of like his that's what they do. Come and... to the son's party to like yeah, where Lucas gives him this rifle, and then later Lucas takes his son hunting, uh, which has like redeemed his relationship with his son. By the way, the the actor who plays the son is really great in this movie. There's oh yeah, sequence. he's awesome. 
that is where it's just from his perspective and it focuses on him and he's great. Yeah, um, awesome. He takes this on hunting and a shot comes out of nowhere, goes right past his face, barely misses him, hits the tree behind him and he's totally stunned. He falls over onto the ground and looks to see where it came from and there's just a silhouette in the distance. And it's... I wasn't sure like who it was supposed to be. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to know, but I think um, it's kind of better if you don't know. Like it, it's scary that it could be anyone. Yeah. Because I think I think what the ending is telling us is that he cannot ever live this down. The rest of his life, he will be living in fear, especially yeah. after this. That anybody he knows could be out to get him, and he yeah, doesn't this know who suggests that there's still great him. tension still roaming right. between everybody of him he'll, he'll never truly be forgiven yeah which i think is like really haunting and really great personally i think it was um not his son but his friend's son the older boy mm. there's a moment at the party when he just gives him a death stare it's kind of like a blink and miss it moment right the brother of the of the daughter of, of the, the daughter girl, yeah of the girl yeah, yeah older brother and i think he's the one that tries to shoot him but i, I again I, uh, it's um it's more of about it's not about who shot him and why it's it's more about what it suggests for the character and his fear and and his life going forward and his life moving forward from yeah. the event yeah exactly it's just to um, suggest that there's just so much tension still have you seen the alternate ending? Uh, no, I have not. So there's an alternate ending. I don't think I need to say a separate spoiler warning for this because it's not in the movie. Yeah. But in the in the Blu-ray that we, me and you both bought for this, um, there's an alternate ending that you can watch, and it's where it's the exact same scene, pretty much, with most of the same shots where he's out taking his son hunting, but the bullet actually hits him. Oh. And he he dies, and then it just cuts to black. Um, personally, I like it better, or I, I should say, I think it's more effective if it doesn't hit him, because even though that sounds like he's, he's getting off the hook, it's actually kind of worse in the sense that now he has to live the rest of his life knowing that he I agree. can never live this down. Like we said, like he will be, always be paranoid, which is kind of a worse punishment as opposed to just Die. dying and never I completely agree. realizing that, that he hasn't been forgiven. It would have been too on the nose if he had died. Yeah. No, I agree. I'm glad that they kept it the way that it is. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And Mads Mikkelsen's performance in that scene, in those last couple seconds, raw terror. Oh, so yeah. Good. He was so terrified. Good. <laughs> As was I. That's That bullet scared the hell out of me. Yeah, dude. It's kind of a little jump scare. It yeah, kind of, it's in not a good a, way. It's not a horror movie, obviously. It's not scary. But that kind of works as a little jump scare. For sure. Yeah. Great movie. Awesome foreign film. To me, the best foreign films or, sorry, international films are the ones where you kind of forget that the subtitles are there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where you're not really... It's not a bother. You're just with it. Parasite. Um, mm -hmm. This one, obviously, another round. Um the studio ghibli movies one inch barrier man um what life is beautiful is another one um yeah just a great movie uh is there anything else you have to say about it no um <clears throat> really the only thing about it that i didn't that i didn't like too much was i feel like there was a couple of weird editing moments like totally nitpicky but I remember there being one or two moments where I thought, oh, that the editing was a little strange. That I feel like they could have cut that in a more cohesive way, mm -hmm. like some very small continuity um, jumps. But yeah, nothing that that degraded the film overall for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd, I'd give it an eight out of ten. Nice, uh, nine out of ten. I was very impressed. I loved it. I was in the mood for it. I love a good fun thriller for sure. Like that's very cinematic, but. I love something that mm. feels real and yeah, and uh, on the edge and very mm. well acted. And I recommend it to anyone who would be interested, for sure. Now, speaking of uh, Mads Mikkelsen, obviously, 
We're talking about Spe another round. Speaking of Mads Mikkelsen and Thomas <laughs> Bo Larsen and Lars Ranth and Suse Wold and Thomas Venterberg and Tobias Lindholm. All right, smart ass. <laughs> <laughs> Sock and you. speaking of the entire country of Denmark <laughs> and the entire country of Denmark and just drinking in general we talk about another round aka Druck uh, Sebastian did you like another round more or less than the hunt um, less but not like significantly mm -hmm. another I think the hunt um, stayed with me more I think Mm -hmm. Whereas another round, um, I mean, I just, I just finished watching this like an hour ago. Right. But um, I'm not sure. It's similar ways, but I, I, I think I would lean towards the hunt personally. But um, Kobe, what is another yeah. round about? Tell us. Another round is about Mads Mikkelsen. Once again, his character's name is Martin. Uh, mm -hmm. He is a teacher. Uh, a history teacher who has become very apathetic, very indifferent towards his class and his career, as have his three other friends who are teachers at the same school. And the four of them, um, they decide to test out this this theory from this philosopher. Do you remember the philosopher's name? No. <laughs> Neither do I. Let me see if I can find it's it. It's some wacky name. Yeah, it's, it's a... It's a um, Damn you, philosophers and your a theory from this we weird ass names. <laughs> Why can't you be named like yeah. Phil <laughs> or something? <laughs> <laughs> or freaking Mark. The four of them decide to test out a theory from this Danish philosopher that basically says that all humans are born with a blood alcohol uh, content level of 0.5% too low. Mm. So everybody needs to be constantly drinking just a little bit during the day in order to uh, keep them more relaxed and more confident and more courageous and make their lives overall better. The, these people believe that it will make their lives better. Mm -hmm. And um, there are ups and there are downs and things don't go exactly as planned. Hence, there's a plot. <laughs> um, Hence a movie. I, yeah. Um, I would actually say that I like this one better than The Hunt, but only mm -hmm. after seeing it the second time uh, this morning. Uh, the first time, I, I thought I kind of liked them the same, so definitely appreciated it after a rewatch. Okay, um, so that's probably where like I'm at right now. Your first time. Yeah, maybe. We'll, we'll see. Another round is a really, really interesting film from... The perspective of the the dogma 95 thing we were talking about earlier it is very authentic like the hunt it is very um real and mundane but it also has these really fun uh sequences that aren't over the top they're not artificial but they are uh they have great uh soundtracks the the songs in this movie are amazing oh yeah they're good um they're all the characters are dancing around having a good time and the camera work reflects that oh yeah uh, for sure. it's very kind of all over the place very um close up kind of shifting focus it's the movie does a really good job portraying um you know revelry i don't know yeah. debauchery whereas like like the hunt was very stationary and smooth and mm -hmm. and precise to give that tension filled um feel to the filmmaking here is very loose and very blurry in way and not too mm -hmm. blurry where it's like i can't see what's happening it's just the focus the focal you know what I'm talking about. Um, mm -hmm. It's very handheld and very uh, free. And uh, it, it, it very much reflects the themes of the movie and what happens in the movie, for sure. Vinterberg said that in making the movie, he wanted to originally make a movie that was simply a celebration of alcohol <laughs> um, and of drunk partying. Uh, yeah. Kind of like you, you sort of mentioned earlier. Um, and... He wanted it to just be about how how alcohol has been used throughout history to make uh -huh. people happier. And you can see um, little bits of that, like in the scene where Martin talks about all the different historical figures who who drank a lot. Or um, there's even a sequence where it uses like actual archive footage of like politicians and world leaders being yeah. drunk. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, that that was funny. <laughs> that was funny. The movie actually has a lot more comedy than The Hunt. Naturally, it's a oh funny yeah premise. This is like a genuinely funny movie. I think I would probably, mm, I would label it like a good dramedy for sure. Yeah, definitely a dramedy. Um, but along the way, you know, in or in keeping with his, um, with his authentic, uh, filmmaking style, it did sort of become a movie that isn't trying to. It's it can't simply just say, "Hey, alcohol is great." Mm-hmm. Um, it is much more of an honest take which is that you know it it can be you can have it can help you have more fun with your friends but at what cost at what to what extent right yeah how much is is too much and obviously these characters reach a point in the movie where they are drinking too much yeah (laughs) and they get just concerned rightfully concerned with where they're going Uh, peeing the bed yeah (laughs) grown men peeing the bed not being able to literally stand up and walk up the stairs it's like really bad not being able to uh catch soccer balls in the gym <laughs> i love that scene when thomas oh, bo larson is like throwing up the soccer balls and he keeps dropping them yeah that's like the most laugh out loud scene in the movie for me i would agree or just uh <laughs> i don't I, any of the moments where they're drunk it's it's like it's really fun there's like one moment like nearing the second like what finishes the second act <laughs> There's a moment where they all just collectively get more drunk than they are throughout the movie because they are on the constant level of low intoxication. Mm -hmm. And at some point, they kind of come together to get shit-faced, basically. And it's really funny, (laughs) until it's not, obviously. But um, that would have probably been... like I think when the the sequence when they're trying to catch the fish, (laughs) if you know what I mean. (laughs) That's such a... (laughs) <laughs> that that was a great scene. I love that. <laughs> One of the guys' wives says you need to buy cod. Yeah, raw and cod. At, once they get to the store, they're too drunk and they can't they can't buy the cod. They knock so they the just wine go over. to the harbor and try to catch. Yeah, one. they're at a harbor, literally fishing for a cod. Yeah, using with like their bare nuts hands. and like their bare hands, and they're falling it's in awesome. the water. <laughs> so funny. And it's not done like in a uh, Ameri- <laughs> We keep bashing American movies. I like, hate American from movies. America. That's why I'm a film major in California. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, the stereotypical American way of making a comedy it would have been super slapsticky with funny music and, oh, look, he fell into the water. Oh, look, there's a shark that bit his butt or something. Uh, no, it, it was. it's kind of realistic funny that these guys are at a pier fishing for cod. Using the bare hands, so it's done. It's done very well, and a big part of that is just the performances of the. Oh yeah, incredible. definitely. I think I think the reason I liked the hunt more is because that had a clear. Um. It was only it was kind of about certain characters in that movie. It was about the main guy, and mm-hmm. the lie. And what it does to everybody around him. Here it has like the group of friends and not not everybody gets a moment to shine as much as some others. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, yeah, not it's not that, super evenly balanced between no, the, the ensemble. No, it's, it's clear who, who uh, which part is written for who, obviously. But... Um, I think that's why, like, the hunt just felt more focused on who it was about, what the story is about, and where it's going. Whereas this, um, maybe it was, I guess, uh, since you know, being intoxicated can get you unbalanced. Maybe it was purposeful. I'm not sure. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, I I think that's probably a reason why I prefer the hunt. Um, but again, nothing. Not that this movie sucks in any way. It's it's both very entertaining and very thought provoking and um probably my favorite ending of 2020 um yeah i great. definitely want to delve into that ending and we can do another little spoiler, little spoiler i feel like this one isn't as big of a spoiler like it's not going to ruin the movie for you but i'll still put something in the description uh, um but first no, i agree we got to get the other the non-spoiler stuff that we still got to talk about out of the way mm-hmm. um it definitely, like we said earlier, works really well as a companion piece to the hunt. There's just a lot of similarities 
not only in the overarching cast and writers, but in individual sequences. Like there's, like we said, the bloody forehead scene where the son has to carry the dad home. There's, um, it, I, I feel personally like you can see some evolution from Vinterberg from yeah. the hunt to here. I think, um, overall the scenes are just a lot more dynamic. Um, there's a lot more blocking there. Yeah. The editing is a lot better in my opinion. Um, uh-huh. I think the editing is really fantastic here. And I think he, the hunt is, is very naturalistic. And sometimes, um, I don't want to say at the cost of entertainment, it's an entertaining movie, but another round I would say better, or it just balances more, um, naturalism with some, and enter- some actual like music, Energy. some actual yeah, yeah, yeah. like fun sequences. And I really want to talk about the music in this movie because I love it so much. Um, in that scene where they're drinking the orange absinthe uh, cocktail and they're just like all oh, of them yeah. are just dancing around and partying and goofing off. They mm-hmm. play Sissy Strut by the meters, which is, oh my God, that is, I want, I want that song to be in every movie. There's <laughs> no movie that couldn't benefit from that song being in it. <laughs> nice. No, I do know. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. I do. And then um, the song that bookends the film, both in the opening uh, of the kids like the opening isn't even of Mads Mikkelsen it's just of all of these random teenagers like running around the lake drunk like goofing off on a train just yeah. getting drunk in public and 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 goofing off I think it's and also it's just to kind of that... set up how much drinking there is in this country in general yeah and in this um, culture yeah I mean Americans drink for sure but not like <laughs> Not like the Danish. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> or the Irish. Mm. Or you know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. so and I think those kids in the beginning, were they the students in the school? They must yeah. have done. Yeah, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, they are. They are. But um it's one of those opening scenes, opening sequences that doesn't like it doesn't really give exposition. It just gives you the right vibes. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it just sets it gives, up like this. It sets the tone. This is the tone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which uh, I thought was good. In both that opening sequence and in the ending, they play um, What a Life by Scarlet Pleasure, which isn't even a song. I think it's an original song written for this movie, right? I'm not 100% sure. I, um, maybe? Like, I don't what a Life care for that song very much on its own like if i listen to it in, on spotify it's like whatever but in the context of this movie it works so well and it's like stuck it's been stuck in my head all day from watching this movie again oh um, i know it, it was great, definitely stuck like, in my head for sure. yeah yeah it's such a great anthem for mads mickelson like dancing around and like dancing his heart out and letting out all of his all of his inner energy out um doing his jazz ballet <laughs> yeah great arc with the jazz ballet it's been brought up many yep. times and then boom he does it great mm-hmm. stuff in a non-cheesy way too it's like it, mm-hmm. you feel good and you feel energized and it's fun and you yeah. feel for him again because of the way that the movie was approached in the beginning very naturalistic and very real but a sense of like a very fun spirit to it and nice looking cinematography very very nice it was very shiny um not flashy like uh uh not to put spielberg down i love steven spielberg with all my heart but his his cinematography and his movies is like shiny and glowy you know what i mean it's not like that it's just uh it's a it's a different kind it's almost like her yeah it's in the a style way. that works better for this for yeah this very naturalistic story okay uh once again if you don't want spoilers for another round you can still hear our uh ratings just go to the link below or go to the description below uh there will be whether you're listening to this on youtube or spotify or itunes Mm -hmm. there will be a a timestamp that you can jump to go to pause this do that now because we're gonna talk about the ending three two one spoilers uh luke skywalker is darth vader what darth vader luke skywalker's father (laughs) did you say luke skywalker is darth vader's father no yes (laughs) i don't know don't worry about it. Some like Futurama time travel BS. Correct. <laughs> Anyways, um, so at the end of the movie, one of the characters, um, Thomas, I think is his name, Tommy, right? Yeah. He 
at, at some point after that whole sequence when they all basically get shit faced and they realize this is getting out of hand and mm-hmm. we don't want to become alcoholics, we should stop this. Their friend Tommy is doesn't stop it quite when everyone else does. He comes drunk to a parent to a teacher meeting, which is very awkward. And um Mads Mickelson's character kind of helps him at the house. He cleans up his his house, he prepares some food. He kind of constantly tells him, Hey, relax with the drinks. Just relax. And unfortunately at some point he goes on a boat with his dog and we don't see it happen, but he crashes and dies. And it's really sad and it's really touching. And it really leads to like the great ending. It's kind of funny because things kind of do tie up in a, in a bow. You know, his, his wife texts him that he misses, she misses him too. Uh, all the students are there. Yeah, uh, Martin's wife. Yeah, after after she's left him. There's a sense of like cliches, but it, it feels earned and it's good. Right. You Things know? are coming together because Martin has cleaned up his act. Yeah, uh, yeah. And um, this is happening right after he has to attend Tommy's funeral and kind of mm-hmm. has that remorse of knowing that he helped cause this. Yeah. The, they kind of collectively are pretty much responsible for this. And they drink to his name and very sad, especially when the the little soccer boys <laughs> go oh to the God. funeral. I was when like, oh, no. Spex puts the flower Spex! on the coffin. I love oh him. Spex is so tiny. <laughs> I love him. Love Spex. Even Spex gets an arc. He was like and sucking. They sing, like the Danish national anthem, I think. I think so. I'm oh. I'm not sure, but it was like really sweet. Um, no, yeah, I was saying Spex gets a Spex is one of the. Tommy is a is a um, is a uh, coach for soccer for little boys, I think at the school, right, or just somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, one of the boys, his name is Spex, who's like really tiny, has glasses, and he sucks at the sport. And, um, but Tommy, the coach keeps encouraging him to obviously get better and to ignore the haters in a way. And at the end, like nearing the end, Spex scores a goal and it's super rewarding and super sweet. And then when Tommy dies, Spex puts a flower in his, in his, uh, in his coffin and it's, I wanted to cry because it, yep. it, it was really sweet. And really well done. And it wasn't hitting you over the head with it. I thought it was really well done. And after the funeral, the characters, the other three remaining characters are out at dinner morning, Tommy. And that's when their students who have just graduated um, Mm -hmm. drive by on party buses and are drinking like crazy pigs (laughs) and um, are, are just absolutely getting wasted and partying their asses off to celebrate. And the teachers end up partying with them, uh, drinking to Tommy's name. And I think because Martin has received the good news from his wife, because things are looking up, he ends up um, getting back into the alcohol. Mm-hmm. And there's that incredible scene where Matt, where they're playing the music. They, the students actually play "What a Life," and Matt Smuggleson starts dancing around, and they're all they're all cheering him on and spraying him with their with their liquor, and he's running in the circle uh like just covered in suds yeah um and then there's this this really striking final shot um where he jumps off the side of the harbor into the water mm-hmm. but it 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 freeze frames while he's in the air and that's when it cuts to to black and the credits roll and that i feel like can be interpreted in and like how did you interpret that Seb? Oh, I didn't get any interpretation personally. I just thought that's really? a funny way to end it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, for me, I, I the first time I watched it, I definitely thought like, um, this is despite the the upbeat music, this is a tragic ending, and he's it, he's falling right. He's like him jumping into the water represents him falling uh-huh. back into into the liquor. Mm-hmm. The ocean being uh, booze, I guess. Um, (laughs) 
But Vinterberg in the interview in his interview with uh, the Next Best Picture podcast said that he's he wanted it to be up for interpretation and he wanted people to be able to have that view. But he, in his mind, uh, the reason it cuts off before he hits the water is because he's flying and it, 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 he wanted to end it with him soaring through the air oh, nice. victoriously, right? Because cool. um, he has sort of learned when to... Like, it's almost like he has learned how to not overuse alcohol, but he's still able to use it for celebration and for fun. And it's an interesting take, like, in the same way that he wanted it to be a a send-up and a celebration of alcohol, and it ended up being something more kind of honest about the the dangers of it. Mm -hmm. In a non-preachy way. Yeah, in a very non-preachy way, for sure. Cause uh, um, like he's like like we've said it, it shows a unique perspective and that you know what sometimes alcohol is not so bad, like uh, right. it's it's pretty good but you need to to an extent I guess to an it's, extent it's you need to watch your limit you need to make sure it doesn't become a habit, and that's with anything, and um, but it's it's almost in that way of it being so naturalistic I almost feel like the film isn't telling you one way or another um, about alcohol is simply showing you what happens it's sh- it's showing you its yeah effect it's just telling you a story saying you decide whether he's flying or falling yeah which i think is really great yeah i love that and i i i really admire and respect when movies do that i think that's something that whiplash does really well oh hell um, yeah whiplash is awesome um if you want to hear our thoughts on whiplash go watch our whiplash episode i think it's yeah. episode four i don't know um uh, <laughs> yeah pretty early it. on i think four <laughs> Um, but yeah, was there anything else, any other spoilers you wanted to say? Or do you want to give your rating? Uh, 8 out of 10 for now. I watched it today. Uh, I can definitely see myself watching this again. I'll probably show it to my parents when the Oscars happen because mm-hmm. they get pretty curious about the ones that win. And I'm pretty sure this is going to win. If, if This is winning best foreign language movie or best international or movie. International no, no. whatever it's no, called. No for sure no. it's gonna win i mean it's the only one with a nomination and director it would be yeah. weird if they gave it to quo vada saida or anything <laughs> else some random other movie i know yeah. but i, I am mean... gonna try to watch all the other ones um before the oscars i i don't think the man who sold his skin is available anywhere right now and i've never heard of it before no. seeing it get nominated mm, but um i am looking forward to watching collective and better days and um Kuvada Saida, which I think are both on Amazon. Anyways, um, yeah, I give this movie, I give another round a 9 out of 10. It went up for me from 8 uh, after rewatching it a second time. It is in my top 10 favorites of this year. I definitely see this as a movie that I can revisit often. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, top 10 for me also. Not that there was that much of 2020, but it's still really great and really well done. Very well directed, acted, shot, um, and just overall a unique perspective on something that could have easily been preachy and overdone Mm -hmm. and offers a unique take. Uh, Yeah, really good. I really liked it. That is all for our discussion on Another Round in the Hunt. Correct. uh, Definitely look forward to seeing what happens with Another Round and Vinterberg at the Oscars this year. Again, we are going to have an Oscars episode down the line. More information on that next week. But for now, Sebastian, my boy. Yes. What you been watching? Um, recently, I think since the last episode, I rewatched. Uh, oh, <laughs> I rewatched the Mummy from nineteen ninety nine, nice. the Brendan Fraser one. Not many people know this. Um, it's my guilty pleasure movie. I adore this movie with all my heart. It is so much fun. It is so campy and 90s cheese. But it's like, um, uh, I, I, I miss like classic adventure movies. Um, I think the last great one we got was what, Tintin? Uh, if only Spielberg didn't like shy away from making those, there would be so much more. But um, yeah, The Mummy is like, one that's not Indiana Jones and not from Steven Spielberg and not Pirates of the Caribbean that I think is like really fun. Um, I rewatched The Goonies. I okay. 
forgot how annoying the kids are in the movie. <laughs> Most of them, besides um, what's his name, Sean Astin, who's like super endearing and super sweet. Sean Astin's great always. Yeah, um, but everybody else is like so annoying. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still like it's super fun. It's classic eighties, um, Spielbergian schmaltz. Um, yeah, you guys, you know what I mean? All that stuff. Super fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, I rewatched Speed. Great action movie. Uh, Bruce Almighty. Uh, yeah, I I just rewatched some some uh, easy watches recently because sometimes during the week can get really really hectic, and I just need an yeah. easy watch. You know what I mean? So, cool, 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 man. Yeah. What Love about it. you? Last night I watched Possessor, which is a buck wild 2020 movie. Oh, um, I've heard of that. It is extremely brutal and disturbing. It is absolutely not safe for the squeamish. Nice. Um, but the cinematography is gorgeous. And I don't want to say anything about the premise. If you're going to watch it, you should definitely go in blind. But mm-hmm. I just want to say this to pique your interest. First of all, it's directed by the son of David Cronenberg. Yeah. And the best way I can I can sum it up is if being John Malkovich was an art house horror. That's... And if that isn't just the greatest elevator pitch you've ever heard, <laughs> this movie's not for you. I mean, being John Malkovich is not too far off from being kind of a horror. It has <laughs> it has ex- has it definitely it's a uh disturbing elements to it but i i i know what you mean like like yeah but this a is a genuine this is horror the horror turned up to 11 for sure nice nice uh and then today i watched one of the documentaries that got nominated this morning my octopus teacher which is a strangely beautiful and kind of like quirky charming documentary about um literally a dude who befriends an octopus and like forms a very very deep bond and very intimate connection with an octopus i made this sound like a shape of water and it's not uh (laughs) i just mean that that he he takes care of this octopus and it um like changes his life for the better i guess Mm, um changes his life it's a solid documentary um but i think the biggest takeaway from it is just that it's cinematography is Oh baby, so good. The nice. underwater shots are like breathtaking, breathtaking. Where, where did you like that, hear about um, this? <laughs> only, only from it getting nominated. Oh, the documentary. It's on, it's on Netflix. Yeah, All it right. got nominated in a documentary. An hour and twenty. I'll probably give it a watch. That sounds cute. Yeah, it's 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 worth it. It's pretty easy watch. Um, other than that, I. I'm 20 years late to this party, but I watched the first episode of The Sopranos finally. Oh, nice. And hot take, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, hot <I'll> take. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, do people, are you like just being sarcastic or do people not like the first episode? No, no, everybody, everybody freaking like worships that show. <laughs> okay. I've been meaning to see that because like I love gangster stuff. So I, isn't that like a definitely... like modern yeah, well, b- this is based only on the pilot, so everybody who has seen this sh- show a bunch, and I'm I'm screwing it up, I'm sorry, but from the pilot, it seems to me like it's more of a kind of meta gangster show than I was expecting. It, like, kind of comments on, like, the characters talk about gangster movies. Oh, nice. And it focuses, it seems to focus more on the mundane aspects of Tony Soprano like there's more there's more screen time of him like grilling steaks for his family and like cleaning his pool and like going to see a therapist than there is of him shooting guys in the head it was interesting it's interesting yeah i'm looking forward to watching the rest of that show and this is on hbo right yes all right i'm just (laughs) i'll I'll see it eventually there's just so many things to watch but yeah, I've heard great things about it. Okay. Alrighty. I think and, we're done. Uh, we are done for this episode. Tune in next week to hear our thoughts on 
Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be watching Godzilla vs. King Kong. And with that, we are watching the original Godzilla from 1960... I'm screwing this up. 1954, oh my goodness. And the original King Kong from 1933. 33, right? I need to double check. That. I am, yeah, 33. I am super excited about this episode. It's going to yes. be really fun. Uh, so, if you haven't seen those, obviously you haven't seen Kong vs. Godzilla. That isn't out yet. But if you haven't seen the original movies and you don't want to be spoiled by it, well, obviously, watch them. Watch them, please. Um, or you just don't care, then stay tuned for our next episode where we have a deep discussion on these classic monster movies. And we will just discuss the cinematic, graphic, thematic, uh, deeply relevant qualities of Big Monkey punching Big Lizard. Big Monkey fight Lizard. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. I'm very excited. I love, I love, Me yeah, too. I'm excited. Me too. And I we're just Big watching 1933 King Kong, not the Peter Jackson one. Um, yeah, we, we, there's so many incarnations of both of those. We couldn't yeah. watch all of them, so we're just doing the originals. Just the original. I know there's like 50 Godzilla movies. Just the original Godzilla and just the original King Kong. In preparation for the new Godzilla vs. Kong. Okay. All right, guys. That is all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, guys. And thank you, Mom, for listening, if you're there still. <laughs> all right. Bye, guys. Don't drink too much. Don't. Uh, don't lie about your teachers. And have a good week. Amen. See you next time.